Thank you. Can you hear me? Microphone, okay. Yeah, welcome for me as well. My name is Michael Haubenwalner. Just remember Haubi. <laughs> it's a little shorter. Yeah, I'm about to provide long-term support with gentle prefix. So let's see if this is still correct. Somehow not. Yes. Well, it, as it is a case study, there is of course a studied case with its own challenges. And next part of Gentoo. Who of you know about Gentoo? Who of you know about Gentoo prefix? Oh, <laughs> quite special. And finally, long-term support, what are the requirements and how do we implement them? For the studied case, I'm working at Salomon Automation Limited is a member of the SSI Schaefer Group. And the SSI Schaefer Group does plan and manufacture warehouses of different kinds. And yeah, and Salomon Automation does provide the software to run these warehouses. For an extract of references, eventually you might see some, some known ones. These are the customers of us. For the challenge, <coughs> when SSI Schaefer manufactures the warehouse racks, Salomon Automation does manufacture the software to run these warehouses. So VAMAS is a shortcut for warehouse management system. It's that simple and is highly customized for each warehouse. The challenge I'm talking about is long-term support, whereas long-term is up to 20 years, sometimes even more. For the nature of Amas being a software, it does need a server and an operating system. Which operating system would you choose where you have 20 years of support? Any idea? Well, because there is no sing single choice, there are lots of them. 20 years ago, well, in 1986, Salomon Automation was founded. From now, 20 years ago, we were somewhere, well, here, I think, AIX4, HP Unix 11, or, or 10, 11, I think, was later. And actually, this is the time when I joined Salomon Automation. So almost 20 years, I have the same job and the almost identical work to do. <laughs> Still interesting, but how would you design your software to run on so many different operating systems? It doesn't work without some abstraction layer in between. <coughs> but which abstraction layer would you choose? Server virtualization is of less use because you don't want to virtualize your server. You still have an operating system on top of the virtualization. Fortunately, almost all software packages you find in a recent Linux distribution these days also do support compiling on whatever Unix system you have. Some of them even support compiling on Windows. Problem now is uh, I haven't found a package manager that, I that is able to build these packages on top of whatever Unix system. So I started with writing self myself one from scratch. 
using one shell and the gene you make. But this got quite hard by time. And the solution for me is to have a custom GNU distribution on top of whatever operating system. Because of these different kinds of systems, it doesn't help to have a binary distribution. So my goal is to have a source-based distribution. So here I am for Gen2. You know Gen2 Linux, you may know Gen2 Prefix, so what's the difference? Both are source-based distributions. They share the almost same set of package definitions. For Gen2 Linux, this is called the Gen2 tree, and for Gen2 Prefix, this is called the Prefix tree. And they share the same package definition format. So where's the difference? Let's have a look at the eBuild. In eBuild, content boils down to configure, make, make install. This is what almost all open source packages support in one or the other way. The configure step is to determine which features does this operating system it is compiled for, <coughs> so, um, which features does it support. But have a deeper look at the configure line. You see here is a prefix. What to do if we make this prefix non-constant? Okay, I keep the slash USR constant and add some variable before that. What is the result of this variable for our comparison? When an eBuild does support ePrefix, for using it in Gen2 Linux, the ePrefix is empty. But in Gen2 Prefix, this ePrefix can be whatever you like. You, you can install Gen2 even in your home directory. Also, this allows to install different versions of Gen2 on one single operating system without any virtualization and run them at the same time. But still, GNU, Gen2 Linux is still a GNU Linux meta distribution and Gen2 prefix does not ship a kernel. It does use the operating system's kernel. <coughs> so in lack of a better name, for now I call this a GNU prefix meta distribution. But as you know, Gen2 usually is a bleeding edge platform or distribution where there is stable and unstable keywords. I have identified a few requirements for my long-term support distribution. Long-term support, as said already, is up to 20 years. This requires a traceable patch management. Tracing patches is one of the most important things in software development. But still, over those 20 years and, and beyond, the quality assurance still has to be continuous. Major releases, well, sometimes they are necessary, but five years, okay, is sometimes, I'd say. Still update releases happen every once in a while, once per year, twice per year, a, a little on demand. Additionally, production servers are not necessarily connected to the internet, so it is necessary to provide some offline install. Of course, for the support team, it is necessary to be able to install hotfixes on demand. Major release upgrades, however, are useless. For the long-term support implementation, the 20 years support, the necessary thing here is independence of the fast forwarding Gen2 development. As a consequence, I need to self-host everything. That includes 
a fork of the prefix tree that lists the subset of. I do call it the LTS tree. Of course, there are VAMA specific packages, e builds. And I have to mirror the source dist files because no one guarantees that you can download an old version in 20 years or 20 years later. This creates different responsibility levels. Okay, there is upstream responsible for the package source distributed as the source dist file. Next level is chain to Linux responsible for the chain to tree providing the chain to tree. Chain to prefix the team actually is, re is responsible for the prefix overlay which is combined with the chain to tree and shipped as the prefix tree. This sh uh, should be the border of the company. Behind the company border, just because of responsibilities, is the VAMA's long-term service team is responsible for the prefix tree fork. <coughs> Additionally, the VAMA's overlay, and I do call this here the VAMA's LTS tree for now. And finally, there is a production team that is responsible for a hotfix overlay. And here are the binaries created. Every level here is still source based. Actually, I do think binary distributions are not much more than a binary cache of this of the out of the source. But anyway, for the patch management, back to the responsibility table. Traceable patch management requires a proper versioning scheme. Okay, upstream has some versioning scheme, how they choose is their problem. They provide a release. Chain to Linux uses this release and eventually may have an additional patch for this release. Ideally, the patch is reported upstream and subsequent uh, responsibilities, responsibility teams use the incoming version as a release, eventually are, have need to provide another patch and do they have to track this one patch in their own overlay or tree, ideally report this patch upstream except for it being some default configuration patch. And an, uh, the next level uses this one again as a release. This creates an innovator derivator uh, tree or graph actually. But then how about the package manager support? Well, of course upstream and chain two is of course supported by the chain two package manager. Within chain two prefix, we do have an additional patch, not upstream in the package manager. And for these levels, the package manager does not support these levels of versioning. I have been able to manage without these levels for now because I'm committed here on, on prefix and eventually Linux as well. But indeed, I did miss patches for default download URLs or something like this. When importing a new prefix version in my LTS tree, I forgot that I did have another patch for the, for the previous version because I was unable to add another level of, of, of release or of, of sub-versioning. So this would be one thing I would love to see in the upstream package manager, whatever package manager this is. For Gento, eventually this is, well, I'm not sure this would be AI API zero still, because this chain to Linux level doesn't have used for this level. 
but of course it has to be specified in the package manager specification. Okay, closing those versioning things. Continuing with the, with the quality assurance. For each e-build or a whole bunch of, I can define an e-build quality in Gento known as the keywords and where this e-build is distributed, that means where this e build from is built a binary. When importing, I start with the unknown keyword. As the LTS3 developer, I do have my development box or at least a prefix instance of whatever box I have. These are not just Linux boxes. These are, well, AIX, Solaris, whatever. And when I am confident that um, this one e-build does work for compilation so far, I do have a special keyword known build bot. Then I do have uh, build bot instances on each supported platform, which does build those build bot keyworded e-builds e for me. When this is successful, <coughs> I tag these e-builds as unstable and it uh, goes for the next level of development and QA. The VAMAS development inside Salomon Automation is split into an innovation team that has it, its own development boxes or LTS instances in some prefix and their own quality assurance builds. So when they test the VAMAS in the QA, of course they don't just test the VAMAS, but they test the LTS distribution as well. And when they say, okay, this piece of this release of, so of VAMAS does work, this also includes it does work with one specific version of my LTS distribution and no, no, no one more patch from wherever. If <coughs> the QA team says okay, then there is a VAMAS release done and not just independent, but at the same time as a VAMAS release, but still when in the VAMAS release some patch or some, some bug fix has to be made, this one bug fix from the LTS distribution is retested for a specific release and one single patch can go stable as well. Next level of the of is the derivation team of the VAMAS development, which is tightly coupled with the customer during uh, development. And they take this VAMAS release. A VAMAS release also is distributed in source, not in binary. So they can implement additional customer needs, however they want. They do have access to the complete VAMAS development source. They do, of course, have their own development box or LTS instance on whatever box. So for now we have five and up to six instances of LTS distributions on one hardware machine without any virtualizations. The QA team of the customer sometimes is joined with the QA team of the VAMAS derivation development. So these two may be one instance on the customer side, on our side, whatever. But finally, here are the final binaries created that do run the warehouse. There's one thing missing, of course, again, the derivation team may provide or should provide patches to the innovation team. That doesn't mean patches are never innovative. I just haven't found another name. I know there are derivatives, but I just found innovation as the opposite of derivation. 
For the major release cycle, I have identified some phases when creating a major release, preparing declaration, implementation, and breaking the previous major release, and again, continuous quality assurance. For preparing a new major release, again, this is the responsibility tree or table. First thing is, I do make the current prefix tree work with the VAMAS overlay and merge these together, or no, not merging, but install from prefix tree additional packages from the VAMAS overlay. And I do create the temporary binaries I compile VAMAS against. So I can see what is necessary to be done in the prefix overlay or this eventually in the Tento tree. So <coughs> I get up-to-date packages in my binary LTS installation and I can test the VAMAS against this, against up-to-date packages. Again, because it, this is one of the really important thing respecting the version, versioning scheme. And again, for the new major release, I need separate automatic build tests again. So I have automatic build tests for the old and the new major release. Especially, I could say, this is necessary for each major release for 20 years. There is one exception for the package manager itself and the package definition libraries, the E classes, which are unversioned in Gen2. When I would import the E classes into my live LTS tree, for sure I bra I'll break the old release. Thus, I have to use an integration branch of the LTS tree, have separate build tests again to unbreak the current stable previous major releases. When I can, okay, when I can build the old major releases and the VAMAS software against the old major release using the new E classes, okay, I say, the E classes aren't too broken anymore for the old E build versions. And they can merge the integration branch of the LTS3 into the master branch. So the old <coughs> major releases get the new package manager because they want to, a be to be able to install the new packages even in the old re releases if necessary. So I need the new package manager Fortunately, both the package manager and the E classes do not provide any runtime thing for the VAMAS application. There is no library source code in the E classes so far. And hopefully this will stay so. For the declaration, again, the same direction. I use the current prefix profile import it into my LTS tree. This is a, a new profile in the LTS tree for the new major release. So major releases are nothing else but uh, profiles, Portage profiles. And here, of course, I can make those tweaks necessary for the, for the LTS needs, can make permanent here. From the LTS3 point of view, declaring the major release is, well, is some picture. This, should, this is the profile open for each version because the implementation is much similar. Import working e-builds, drop the existing e-build tags, the keywords, and tag them again as for the build bot. So I can use the new e-builds, the new versions of packages combined with the VAMAS overlay 
to test my, my RAMAS instance again. From the LTS point, point of view, importing e-builds is something like this. For unbreaking the previous, again, <coughs> each previous major release profile needs to get masked the new and uncompatible and maybe dangerous package versions. This is the new profile open for any version of packages and the old profile, if I won't change the old profile, I would get GCC 4.8 or Python 3.4 in the old major release where I did have GCC 4.2 and Python 2.7. I can accept the for the old release to upgrade from patch, patch 3 to patch 4, but I can cannot accept upgrading Python releases and GCC releases because with a newer GCC, this is unlikely to be able to compile the old version of Ramas. So I set the package mask and say, okay, the old release accepts bash 4, but does not accept Python 3 or GCC 4.8 or whatever version. And because the old release accepts bash 4, bash 3 can go out. Again, the quality assurance for the old release, it is enough so far to have uh, the old Vamas release be so far usable <coughs> with the old packages with, uh, uh, compiled with the new E-classes, the old LT LTS3 profile with the new E-classes. Because the E-classes, as said already, don't provide source code for libraries, when I'm able to compile with the new E-classes, I'm pretty sure the install libraries still work as long as the VAMAS application by itself is compilable as well. And now for the new release, again, continuous quality assurance from top to the bottom. Because new customer instances, of course, use the new version, the new major release, so the complete QA process can be implemented. For update releases, an update release contains all major release profiles that have to be still, that still need support. Over 20 years, well, actually, this is all major release profiles. To ease creation of update releases, I do have automatic snapshot creation once a week, and the outcome is the eBuild 3, I do call it the VAMAS LTS 3, with the creation date. And when I do say, okay, this snapshot is fine for a release, I do set the VCS tag. From the LTS 3 point of view, back in 2010, the whole tree is used as the update release, as the eBuild 3 tarball, and the VCS tag is set for the old date. For the new, or for the current um, update release, for the current release tarball, the current tree is, is used with both major release profiles, with the package mask for the old release, and of course the VCS tag with the current date. For the offline install, in addition to the eBuild 3 tarball, I also do create a source disk files tarball containing every package disk file necessary to bootstrap and install each major release with the stable keywords. Additionally, and finally, of course, an all-in-one setup script is crucial. To this also is created by the snapshot creation, by the automatic snapshot creation, and pre-configured to use 
these two tabboards. Important thing here is an easy to use command line script to, so the product uh, installer <coughs> on the customer side or even on the derivative of Amas team side are easily able to install an instance of the Vamas LTS distribution. Hotfixes, we already have seen them. They are the production team, the Vamas derivation team or the service team is responsible for the hotfix overlay. The hotfixes don't necessarily go through all the QA process because when they are uh, through the QA process, they aren't hotfixes anymore. And for major release upgrades, because of the prefix support, I do have multiple instances on one machine and I install the old re major release in some directory and the new re major release in some other directory. So I don't have need to upgrade this installation to the new major release program. Any more questions? This is accessible only for me because, well, we don't have real need or, or who else would have need for the old tabboards because they don't have the build instructions anymore. Yeah. So we um, reference to an archive uh, mm -hmm. server where the they can get it, but I don't know how long is the process of to mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, usually um, upstream eventually will have to have the bit files or should be able to recreate them from their VCS because they really should have VCS tags when they distribute the tabboard. So <laughs> this is eventually in case for dead upstream. Or well, if upstream is dead, still the VCS could be accessible. Um, yeah. If you have a specific need, you can ask if I have it in my repository, of course. You mean why I don't build the binary beforehand? Wait a little. I'll which kind of binary should I pre-build? I don't know beforehand which version of Solaris the customer really has. I do know or what the requirement is for the customer to provide some operating system with file system support, a C library, and ideally POSIX API. And of course, for installing the, L the VAMAS LTS distribution, of course, a compiler is necessary, but I do 
but this compiler from the operating system is only needed for bootstrapping my own compiler, my own GCC. And often, well, often, yeah, sometimes it happens if you apply some patch for the operating system, this may change some system header file. GCC, because as I don't have write access to the system header files on a target machine, GCC does copy the system header files. And when I distribute GCC binaries that includes the copy of my own system header files, I don't get the target systems patch applied to the copied um, system header files distributed with the GCC binaries. So we really compile on the customer's production machine. Or if the customer really has more than one so far equal production servers, um, then we compile on the oldest uh, patch release for this operating system just for this one customer. And this one customer uh, then copies the binaries across his distribution servers. But this then again is true for the Vama software as well. Compile the whole GNU package stack beginning from, from above the C library up to your final uh, application binary on one single machine setup at least. Because when you have old binaries built with an, an older patch release of whatever operating system, subsequent compiling the Vamos application may produce unexpected results. So still, again, a real distribution really works if it is source based. The binaries can be done, yes, but it's just a, a cache. Liptool, um, yeah, <laughs> and that's it. Liptool in the sense of um, how, <coughs> how to correctly build shared libraries on AIX to get its own M support. And one challenge was the Windows thing. Um, as you see, the last Windows I have added here is 2K3 because this was the last one we were able to build this LTS distribution on. However, the build system on Windows Server 2003 was the POSIX subsystem, the Interix or SUA services for Unix applications. In Windows 2000, it was Cygwin. Cygwin got unstable with Windows XP so with uh, server 2K3, we choose Interix. We were, because this was the only one we were able to get stable with some workarounds. Interix again got unstable in Windows Server 2008. It was deprecated with Windows Server 2012 R1 and were not part anymore uh, in Windows Server 2012 R2. So right now we are seeking for some POSIX system, for some working, stable working POSIX system on Windows, yes. We have tried using Linux in some virtual Hyper-V, whatever, uh, to call the native compiler, but yeah, <laughs> this works in theory, but isn't stable. It does produce object files. 
with the build system running on Linux using the Microsoft compiler tool chain running on Windows, but the file system is file system synchronization well doesn't work for this workflow. Anyone else? Okay, 45 minutes. Thank you.